is chronic wasting disease, um, transmissible, transmissible um, spongiform um, encephal encephalopathy. I always mess that up. But this is a disease that um, is actually a virus that uh, um, it's a disease that affects deer. Um, and the host is cervids. And what is odd about it is this is a prion and it's not a living organism that causes this. There was a long debate when I was taking virology that uh, prions were living organisms because it's a protein that is itself, it's just folded incorrectly. And it's the weirdest um, thing, but the most dangerous um, on a treat because you can't tell your body to treat itself. You can't create a protein to attack itself, if that makes sense for vaccines. So they are misfolded proteins that have ability to transmit their misfolded shape onto normal variants of the same protein. Your body will not attack itself, so you cannot treat it. Um, the origin of this disease is unknown. The first case was in the late 1960s at Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, since then, it's been documented in, documented in 26 states, uh, majority in the Midwestern United States. Um, vectors for um, spreading this uh, disease is shredding uh, prions, and that's through feces, saliva, and urine. Um, it can do horizontal and vertical transmission. So horizontal means it goes from deer to deer, and vertical means it, um, they think they're doing research can go from mother to um, infant and within the belly. So that's how that is a very distinct way of spreading. Um, to continue on to it, it's got a long incub um, incubation period, which will make your life hard if you can't see effects until 24 months out. Um, with it, there's some clinical signs, PUPD, um, in the veterinary world, that means increased thirst and tons of urination from drinking, drooping head and ears, lethargy, behavioral changes, and rough coat and weight loss. Um, but with the incubation of 24 months to 18 months, you know, it, it takes a while to see all these effects. Um, to di the diagnostic test is a post-mortem sample, which means you can't get it from a living being. It'd have to um, be from a... Um, dead deer, um, much like when you do rabies, um, from the retropharyngeal lymph node. So you just, you know, you need these samples, but you need them to the head to be removed or the tonsils or anything like that to um, get them to a lab. The treatment, there's no treatment or vaccine. There's a hundred percent mortality rate. And the cause of death actually is the prions cause death in neurons in your brain. So you, you basically go brain dead. Um, when it comes to prevention, there's certain bait parts and bands, as in you don't use urine or so like that to spread it. And captive deer restrictions um, are big because if it's a captive by, uh, if they're captive, the disease can spread super fast. Response, the best way to do it is to educate the public and uh, ban the urine and food baits that attract these deer together, making the disease a lot um, easier to spread. Another one that's a sad case is hemorrh um, hemorrhagic uh, disease of deer. Let me move this real quick. Episodic hemorrhagic disease virus or blue tongue virus. Um, the origin is an orbivirus, um, causes both um, blue tongue virus and episodic hemorrhagic um, disease, or EHDV is what we'll, we'll say. Uh, the host is actually a white tailed deer, the white tailed deer. Um, the region, all continents besides the Arctic, you um, have seen this. Seasonal with summer months being the most acute cases versus chronic. Um, the North seem to have sporadic cases, but higher mortality um, and higher mortality rates. Where Southern states where it's a lot warmer um, have annual cases with lower mortality rates. And the reason that is, is the vectors themselves are uh, midges or noceums or gnats. They bite the deer and transfer the virus next to the deer. The midges can't fly that well. So if they find a pack, they can use wind to go. But it usually, if you've ever been in the South, they'll just, they'll just get you and they are gonna get a small group. And if they're spreading the virus, it's going to hit pretty fast. All right, so with this one, the incubation period is five to 10 days. 
not good either um, because the clinical signs are lethargy, dull and rough coat, um, red skin and mucous brain, membrane gets red, recumbency, they don't want to move, acute and chronic symptoms, chronic we'll get to in a second, but acute symptoms meaning it comes on fast and within five to 10 days, the deer usually is, is super sick and if they do pull through, it gets chronic. And what it means is if they do make it through the virus part, chronically, they're still gonna have some side effects. They're either gonna be so skinny they can't make it through winter. They're either going to have respiratory problems. And it's, it's, it's major things. They're gonna have hoof cracking from, um, from this disease or this virus. The diagnostic part is a pre, um, just di uh, diagnostics based on the symptoms. Usually you'll see dead deer and that's how you will know the clinical signs of the dead deer, but usually you find the dead deer. You don't see these symptoms. There's no uh, treatment, monitor it, they let the courses play out. There's no um, current management, this typo right there. And the mortality is 16 to 23%, but the cause of death is actually edema uh, and um, hemorrhagic and necrosis and ulceration. And so what we'll go there is basically you, you cannot coagulate blood and it's rupturing these blood cells all over you. And then your blood vessels go, you basically get necrosis because you cannot stop all these vessels from bleeding and your um, coagulants just go haywire and you, you bleed and nonstop. And so that's where this is. You'll just see constant blood, every vessel blood, um, blowing. And that causes the crack of the hooves too. The vessels by the hooves will um, just rupture and then they just never heal back right. And if that's where your chronic is, you suffer that. Okay, <clears throat> another topic we're gonna move on to based on the rubric is echolocation. There's two orders of echolocation, the uh, chiropetra, chiro, yep, Charoptera and Articala, uh, bats and, and mammals, uh, bears, bats and um, whales, dolphins, and um, those are your two that are going to use it. The definition of echolocation is the use of a sound wave and echoes to determine where objects are in, are in a space, um, any given space. Um, the discovery was pretty awesome. Donald Griffin and G.W. Uh, Pierce created a um, crystal that could transform ultrasound and frequencies audible to humans, and they termed it echolocation because they were so um, they were wanting to know how bats are moving, and that was how they determined echolocation. The species I actually selected was the bottlenose dolphin, and how they use it is they produce a sonar signal in its nasal systems by forcing air through a pair of lips known as the phonic lip. And it's about three centimeters below the, um, the blowhole. Another thing with echolocation, but not really with echolocation with the dolphins, but it's cool on communication in, in terms, they have a signature whistle. This allows for dolphins to identify and communicate with each other. Um, and it, it, it it's identifies distinctly who the other dolphin is with their little whistle. Scientists actually recorded this and they can actually see what dolphin is what based on a whistle. But how it works is sound waves travel through the water at speed about um, 1.5 kilometers per second, which is 4.5 um, times faster than the sound traveling through air. So they shoot this pulse out, the brain receives the sound waves in the form of a nerve input but relays a message into the sound and able the dolphin to interpret the sound and meaning. So they hit it with sound, sound reverts back. They're like, that's a solid object. That object's moving. If it was there first, it's moving to the left. It's there, it's still this size. And so that's how they do it. Um, so they determine the size, shape, speed, and distance direction, and even some of the internal structures of the object in the water. Again, they're shooting the sound. If it's a rock, hits back, they shoot the sound again. The rock doesn't move, but it's only getting um, the changes the sound frequency is changing while they're moving, they know it's an um, object. But if a fish is there, they hit it, they're getting closer. Now it's coming from this direction and it's either further or closer away, um, still moving, they know it's a moving object in the fish. So a cool thing is dolphins with compromised eyesight will take more time to actually echolocate and identify before moving forward. Um, so the next thing on the rubric was picking a species that 
was in an order but wasn't covered. So we did order Redenta and I did the common uh, Degu and Octagon Vegas is the Akodon Vegas is how the um, scientific name um, is in the order Redenta, cute little thing. Characteristics, about nine to 12 inches, six to 14 ounces, yellow to brown fur, cheek is a height, um, hypsodont, and they live about five to eight years. Some um, more information about them. They range, they're West Central Chile, um, lower slope of the Andes. The habitat is semi-arid and Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean type shrubland ecosystem. Um, they have to be, because they're in the Andes, they have to be below the elevation of 1200 meters. And there's about 75 degu per um, hectare. Um, diet, they're herbivores, they leave, they leave bark and seeds. Um, reproduction, they breed once a year, September and October with uh, four to six offspring, 90 to 95 day gestation period, four to six weeks until weaned but they meet sexual maturity 12 to 16 weeks for females and 16 weeks for fem uh, males. They live in about one to two uh, groups of one to two males and two to five related females, and they're very vocal. Um, they're least concerned on conservation status. And why did I pick them? I went to school in college with a guy from Chile, and he just kept talking about um, these, little, these little mice, which I thought they were just mice, but he explained how they were vocal and everything like that. And so he was talking about them. So next thing we went over was invasion species. So I, a little bit about me, I'm trying to watch my time, but a little bit about me is I lived in Florida and I worked at a, a preserve that had about uh, 200 acres on it. And um, we dealt with wild hogs all the time. And we actually had to end up pretty much hunting a good bit because they were ruining the ecosystem so much that we would, we would check one side of the system and come back and one side of the preserve would be fine. And then they would just root them all up. And it was horrible. So characteristics of them, let's first go over it. They have brown and orange coats. Um, sometimes they even have brindle. Sexual dimorphism, males are 10 to 15% larger than females and they can weigh up to 75 to 250 pounds. They can also run to at 35 miles per hour. Um, reproduction, four to 12 piglets a year with sexual maturity at six to eight months. Versatile omnivores, AKA they will eat anything and everything they can get their mouth on. Um, they use these large tusks and actually dig it up. You know, they're not as prevalent as like a wild boar somewhere else because these are feral swine, feral pigs, but they use large tusks to root it up. And habitat, they can do warmer climates, any environment, cold climates. They, they are mostly on the southeast and the um, parts of the west coast, but they're getting them up as far north. So they're moving. Um, so they're, they're becoming a major nuisance. Um, so this is on the left side. Um, this is the range on 1982. You can see where they start in the southeast, South Carolina being the big one, where I'm from, and then Florida being the, um, completely inundated. And they are, that's 1982. Now they have spread, they've pretty much taken over the whole Southeast. These are high mountainous ranges right here in Tennessee. So they didn't really take over those. Um, but they're moving, look, it's moving near Maine and everything, New Hampshire. They're moving up there and they're moving towards the West Coast now. So this is uh, becoming a problem. They're adapting. And they were introduced in the 1500s by settlers with domestic pigs, but in the 1930s, the um, wild boar was brought over it where it mated with pigs and the population still grows today. Those two mated and they created the feral swine. Rooting, like I said, is the horrible part of them. Rooting is actually what is causing a lot of this damage. And what they do is they take their tusk and they just push this, the dirt and roots, de-rooting everything in the process. Um, two to six million exist in the United States and Canada. Um, half those members are actually in the state of Texas. And poor Texas suffered 400 million um, of damages annually, $400 million of damage annually in Texas alone. The problem is in the Southeast, if we go back here, there is really no natural predator for these, these large, large creatures. Um, even if you get to the Midwestern, there's still nothing really can take them down. Now, if you go up here, yes, there's some black bears and stuff, but even then, it's, it's too hard to fight a wild boar when you can just go get some deer 
and it's not worth it. So there's not really a natural predator and they eat everything and anything they can get their mouth on. So there's no great way to manage them. We're working on non-lethal and lethal methods. Trapping seems to work, but they can get into groups of 50, um, about 15, but you group them and they just keep having piglets and it's just, it's horrible. So what we did, uh, what we did, this is how it would look in Florida. This is in the Midwest at times, but they would, uh, you would come out and it just all, this is the best picture I get. All the natural vegetation and ecosystem was um, destroyed. We would find gopher tortoises just messed up, like babies just chewed up and left out, or even, I don't know where the rest of them, eggs tossed up from the nest. Uh, we'd find be dead baby deers where they would just grab them when they were hiding and just eat them and kill them. They didn't eat them, they just killed them. Um, it was, I, it just, it really was sad to see what they would do to a system. And we didn't even, you know, so the best way to do it is um, the best thing that people are trying to do is they're not putting hunting limits on them. Um, it's a shoot on site. And they're even thinking about putting bounties, but it, it seems to be an unbeatable war without any natural predators. So the last thing we covered was some caribou based on the shaper. So it, first, let me explain the term caribou refers to the various subspecies present in North America. And the term reindeer is used to describe domesticated and semi-domesticated or wild species in um, Eurasia. And I had to make that clear because it even confused me when I was reading the paper and trying to figure out what's the difference if they're the same species. But it turns out there's uh, seven different subspecies, but we covered five different subspecies. And the first one we started was the peri caribou, and that's on your right side. Peri caribou are found in the Arctic tundra habitats on islands of the Canadian Arctic um, in the Northwestern Territory of Canada. They small groups, uh, no larger than 12. They're able to outrun wolves, which was actually interesting because I just think wolves would be faster and they're great swimmers, but they're not long distance migrators. Um, their numbers have declined the thin ice, not allowing mi um, migration between islands, um, but the numbers started improving. And so they might be even taken from the endangered list and moved to the threatened list. The next one is the Bering Ground Caribou. Um, the habitat range, they are still in the Northwestern Territory of Canada and Alaska. 50% of them are in Canada. 50% uh, of the caribou are actually in, in Canada. Um, social behavior, the large groups, uh, eight large migratory herds that make up all the population of the caribou. Um, they migrate seasonally. They are threatened now, um, and their numbers are actually not improving. They are steadily declining. Um, so unlike the peri caribou, they, they have a harder chance and a harder time ahead of them. The Salvard, um, Salvard reindeer, I hope I'm pronouncing that right in the butcher. They actually live in Norway. Um, it's about, there are about 100,000 of them. They live in small groups to about three or five. They have no natural predator in Norway. And um, gratefully, they're actually the least concerned on conservation status. They're doing pretty well, even with a small amount of numbers. But with no natural predators in Norway doing pretty good in conservation, um, they are actually thriving. And habitat and range of the last one, uh, well, this one is actually RT teridus, are the European reindeer. Um, it's in the Arctic tundra and peninsula of Northern Europe. In the winter months, they travel to evergreen forest areas. In the spring, and they return to the tundra. This is a natural mass migration between two areas. They live in about six to 13 groups. Both sexes have antlers. Three million are domesticated in Europe. And the population seems to be very stable. And the last one is the RT caribou. And that is the North American caribou. It's a habitat range, Canada's boreal forest, the open to along the Hudson Bay coast. Um, largest of the caribou species, vast majority of them live in Canada. There's only about 3,000 left. They're considered very endangered now. Um, decreased numbers because of overhunting by wolves, of all things, when I was reading it. Um, decreased numbers for over successful predation because we fragmented the forest, which means the wolves have a, uh, a straight shot to um, get them. 
So sadly, that's I, not sadly, but that was just interesting to me. So that that's why they were decreasing numbers. And there's all other things, but over success killing was um, one of them. Well, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I hope this is everything you needed. Thank you.